and see if this one stays on. Okay. So has everybody read the articles for tonight? <laughs> There's no good way of asking this question. <laughs> you have to have like anonymous slips of paper are handed up. <laughs> the, uh, okay, let me get started uh, very quickly. What we're going to do tonight is I just really wanted to start. We're in the section of the reader which has section of the reader which is on the cyber cultures reader and the subject basically for discussion there was we're going to do popular cyber cultures and really focus on forest piles making cyborgs making humans of terminators and blade runners uh, Scott Buchanan's terminal penetration and Allison Landberg's prosthetic memory total recall in blade runner and just before I uh, you know I thought what we do really on those you've seen terminator Seen Blade Runner? You haven't seen, who hasn't seen Blade Runner? Is that true? You have been culturally deprived. This is horrible. The, because uh, Blade Runner is really, oh my God, this is horrible. I should turn over a class just to showing Blade Runner. Blade Runner is a really great film. And you, so you have a great treasure to see in the future and stuff like this. This really is good. So I thought what we'd do, well, you've, we've seen the, maybe you've seen the film, describe the film a little bit, but then maybe we could have a discussion about the, you know, really the thesis that are going on, the thesis that are in the the, th the uh, articles themselves. And what I'd just like to start with, though, is just, in, and it's really for my own benefit of completion, because last week we were discussing uh, part one, approaching cyberculture, Michael Benedict's cyberspace first steps. And I just really wanted quickly to just uh, go through the main thesis of the counter perspective on that, which is Arturo Escobar's perspective, Welcome to Siberia, Notes on the Anthropology of Cyberculture. Because in the first section of the book, these two perspectives, Michael Benedict and Arturo Cyber Escobar, their perspectives really counterpose one another. So I just, and the reason I want to do that is because in the next section, popular cyberculture, these two different perspectives then really come into play. One sort of like really tech utopian and messianic, and the other really saying, well, no, let's really think about the, you know, the actual social and political and gendered an ideological context of technology to really come into play itself. So the remember last week the discussion focused on Michael Benedict and Benedict's perspective, you know, emphasized the messianic and the mesmerizing and the mythic dimensions of cyberspace. And Benedict made the argument that the wired world brings alive something which is really basically very ancient in ourselves and as he says very reptilian. It opens up a part of our brain that is not individualistic, he says, but it's tribal, it's mythic, it's not rational, that we become a web and not a self. So the argument that I made in class following that is that you can take Michael Benedict's article and then you can really stream through a lot of literature on technology and politics and culture from Marshall McLuhan through Teilhard de Chardin to Nicholas Negroponte to a whole variety of others and a lot of artists. And they'll all have basically the same perspective, which is to say that to discuss the impact of technology, we really need to understand like the mythological dimension of technology, that it really speaks to something really deep within ourselves. And you know, it was very beautifully put in Benedict's article when he says that it speaks to something which is you know, very ancient in the part of the brain itself. It releases the part of the brain which is tribal and sort of an electronic tribe within us. Now Escobar, writing as an anthropologist, you know, independently, and the articles aren't written against, with and against one another, but Escobar's perspective is very different because he's much more cautious, eh? Because Escobar, writing as an anthropologist who really studies the relationship between, you know, social movements and questions of gender and class and ideology and the social construction of reality itself, says that technology is not mythic, but technology is always socially grounded that at any time technology reflects questions of class and power and gender and sexuality and the social construction of reality. So one's, you know, very tech utopian perspective and very messianic and the other perspective is much more cautious and says, well, let's pay attention to really the social and political constitution of technology, to questions of really technology and politics and media. And for example, on page 69, Escobar says this, he says, science and technology have remained captive to the historical mode of the West, particularly to you know, the whole discussion of modernity. A narrow-minded, instrumentalist, and economic posture 
has characterized our common sense understanding of technology, while science has adopted the linear and reductionist perspective. Rather than being neutral instruments that facilitate or allow certain human endeavors, science and technology produce life worlds in the division of the social field in certain ways. In short, science and technology don't just produce life worlds, they actually produce culture itself. And I was sort of, you know, sort of thinking about that, and I was down in the United States on a conference over the weekend, and I was sort of thinking what Escobar had said. Because you go from Canada and you go into American society. You know, we're really a deeply technological society. And suddenly you realize that you're okay, left really the Canadian life world, which is constructed in some ways by our media, and into the American life world itself. And there, you know, I'm sitting in a culture which is, you know, the height of technology, flooded with media, and you sort of circulate within the mediascape itself. And I found a culture which people were really very fearful, in which free speech was, you know, this was in an academic conference at a very prestigious university. You'd expect free speech would be free. You go out in the streets and say, well, there's no, not too much free speech here. You walk around the streets, and then you notice, and you go in the malls and stuff, and people are looking at you. You know, you're not from the town. Who are you? The strangers come in. And I was thinking what Escobar said is that the media, which has continuously, you know, exhumed the events of 9-11, you know, for purposes almost now of like, I don't know what purpose, for many purposes, vicarious pleasure of the spectacle, mourning, images of, you know, anthrax scares. You know, t t uh, la two nights ago I turned on the uh, ABC News, and ABC News gives me a life world, begins to tell me about smallpox. Have you been inoculated for smallpox? And the last I had read, they had actually done away with the vaccine because smallpox had been cured. And then suddenly, you know, panic supplies of emergency numbers of, you know, vaccines of smallpox are going to be prepared for the population as a whole. And then it went into the minutiae of the exact preparations, how school gyms and malls and church basements are going to be used as smallpox vaccination centers. The next day I get the New York Times and it's got a whole page devoted to the smallpox crisis. And really, I, you know, I'm not too fearful at the moment of getting smallpox, but by the time I had been within that life world, you begin to feel very anxiety, you know, very sort of a feeling of anxiety and anxiousness itself. And I thought it would be very hard if you're living within the intensity of, I mean, if you're living within the intensity of the media itself, and you're getting smallpox, well, you say, well, you know, perhaps I'm not fearful of myself, but what about my children? You know, what kind of, you know, do I have to think about my family? And I think that's what Escobar is saying. Escobar is saying that, you know, the mediascape really does produce a life world, and the life world has really definite emotional effects. It creates panic, creates fear, creates anxiety itself. And then Escobar goes on to say that it doesn't only produce this kind of you know, randomly, but it produces two specific kinds of life world. And I just wanted to, there's a chair right here though. <laughs> Those rolling chairs. Thanks. Got it. So he says that the science and technology today in the media produce two very specific types of life world or two specific kinds of culture. He says, first of all, it produces he says, like, two forms, two directions in technology are critical, and we're going to be talking about those today through movies. He says, first of all, the technology of artificial intelligence. And so then as a reflection of artificial intelligence, and he's talking about computer and information technologies, and he says that the whole regime of artificial intelligence creates what he calls technosociality. Technosociality. And just mention the term because it really is going to be really important in our discussions. In other words, that the whole discourse of artificial intelligence produces a technical world in which we begin to think and act and I think sort of feel like computers. Like things like, you know, like the, the normal boundaries between the world of computers and machines and the world of humans begins to crack wide open. The warps begin to, you know, bend a bit. And it's not so easy to tell any longer where the thing that we call a computer that we used to think of as a machine on the outside ends and where human beings and human emotions and human speed begin. A technical world is created, like real-time communication. If you're on the net, every one of us always knows now two times. It's just common sense. We know like 
you know, non-real time, supposedly, the time of our lives, which has duration. But we also live in real time, like how fast are your messages going and things like this. What is the cyber speed of your message? And if you've been using Alcor, been on any Concordia email in the last, since school began, it seems, have you noticed that Alcor has slowed down? Have you noticed this? We do an electronic journal, and we really depend on Alcor to be very fast and stuff like this. And suddenly I was saying, well, this is like going back to the age of tablets or something of the sort. You know, pages would refresh about like one minute later, but then you're almost, you know, like at cyberspace, you say, well, I've got to slow down. And things are not moving very fast at all. You know, real time begins, in fact, to actually approach real time, which is, you know, haphazard and has accidents and it's slow and fast and things like this. Or we begin to download memory. We begin to put on our screensaver face, begin to cue activities. You become sort of a center of instant messaging, parallel processing. Speed is all consuming, and you find yourself sort of moving in these two kind of different speeds. And we've become completely used to things which used to be only knowable through the language of technology and computer technology. That is, we engage in multitasking, parallel processing, multiprogramming, multinetting. We can be in many places at one and the same time. And we're very used to just sort of flipping and being very conversion itself. So activity, which used to be just related to a thing called a computer in the outside of us, you know, Escobar would argue, in fact, comes inside of us. And our subjectivity becomes coded by the internal logic of the computer itself. And the discourse of the computer becomes, in fact, the life world that we begin to live in. So Escobar writes about this as one type of, he says, one type of you know, new kind of sense of the self or social self that begins to emerge. And he says the other kind of image of the self or vision of the self that begins to emerge or life world that begins to emerge is what he calls biosociality. And here he's saying not our, just artificial intelligence, but what about genetic engineering? You know, these two kind of key technologies. Like artificial intelligence, you know, comes inside of us. And our minds, you know, become sort of framed by the logic of the computer and the speed of the computer and what it makes possible and what it shuts down. And at the same time, the logic of biotechnology also comes inside culture and society. And you know, without even any discussion about it, we're already really deep in a new era of genetic engineering and of stem cell research and of cloning and of artificial evolution. We change human DNA. We speed up and we slow down the actual speed of light itself. We engage in like experiments at Stanford University don't any longer simply engage in experiments in natural evolution, but actually they've begun experiments, successful experiments, in the artificial evolution of new life forms. We have, you know, engineered food, giving us hybrids as sterile. So Escobar would say we live in these two kind of life worlds without really any discussion. One is what he calls a techno-social life world. The language of computer technologies comes inside of us and really remakes us very deeply in terms of how we think and we feel. And then secondly, the language of genetic engineering and molecular biology comes inside us and inside culture as a whole. And we begin to live in a culture in which things that used to be just science fiction, like cloner culture or transgenic beings, beings who are half flesh and half metal and half plants or a third plants, begin in fact to be like realities that can actually be created. A person I met in the weekend at this conference who heads up a wonderful program at MIT called Computing Culture said that he, his lab on computing culture, which thinks of the social and political consequences of computer technology, is right across the hallway from a guy, a huge research team headed up by a, an engineer that are doing new nanotechnology uniforms for the U.S. Army. Nanotechnology uniforms for the U.S. Army. So the U.S. Army, you think, well, doesn't stand outside cyberspace. They want to be cyborgs as quickly as possible. He said right down the hall he was interested in those new Predator drones, you know, the ones they were using over Afghanistan, unmanned, basically, um, unmanned, you know, drone aircraft equipped with Hellfire missiles. So you can actually, as they've done, you can literally sit in the Pentagon in Washington and you can observe, if you're one of the commanders, you can observe.
at this kind of performance act for what we're going to for the subject matter of this class, which is the three films, because the argument that this a text makes it says the text really says that we live in an age of uh, clonal engineering and new reproductive technologies and artificial intelligence. You know, uh, you know there are vats in Montreal and in Boston, up and down the coasts of California, and goodness knows where else, where organs are grown in those vats. We splice together the eyes of a jellyfish in the body of a rabbit. It's done for artistic purposes, like by an artist like Eduardo Koch. We eat genetically altered food. So really, the question that these films that we're going to talk about today, you know, Terminator 1 and 2, Blade Runner, Alison Landsberg's perspective, artificial intelligence, the matrix, is what is the meaning of being human today? Where does being human begin and end? And where, in fact, do we enter into the age of technology and machines itself? What happens when the edge between human beings and machines and the plant worlds is increasingly blurred and becomes ambivalent itself. And the thesis of this book is that, that there are certain forms of representation, cultural representation, particularly in films, which in fact are ways of working out the future, ways of working out you know, present human anxieties, and present human concerns itself. They do kind of deconstruction in this. And that these films work to undermine the easy kind of divisions between the organic and the mechanical, between the spectator and the spectacle. And they all have the same kind of internal language. They all have upbeat endings, because these are American films. They all have downbeat analysis. They're all futuristic images, and typically, the content for them is film noir aesthetic. You know, it's sort of like Welcome to the Future, and what future is being represented? Or do they really represent a future, or are they all just really humanist fantasies about the future? Sorry, you have your hand up. Welcome to my not very common desk. Um, look, I find it hard to in reading fiction or watching fictional movies about cyberspace. It gives us this impression of what cyberspace should be, and there is a sometimes blur thing that we are now, you know, living in these worlds in a sense. Um, but I find it really hard to realize that we are because a we're living it, so we don't see the big picture, and also we have these ideals that are built up for us from through the movies and through the books. So I guess I'm just wondering, like, is it expected that? Yeah. Well, what about Terminator? Terminator 1 and Terminator 2. You haven't seen Yeah, no, I know. But it's sort of interesting to go back to one of the original, you know, because, you know, the, the, the um, you know, Forrest Piles text on this says, you know, Blade Runner and Terminator begin, and I quote, with a technological threat to humans as their narrative point to departure and make that threat into an occasion for a cinematic treatment and explanation of the status of the human. Each film asks what happens when the status and fate of the human become intertwined with the technologically produced image of the cyborg. And then it says, well, these films can evoke such you know, anxiety, or at least fascination, maybe because they're really a reworking through our own you know, really ambivalent feelings about the future, or is it the present itself? Yeah, because we were sage enough to code them and program them so that they'll never really rebuild. Boy, those are fighting words. <laughs>
because we always see that computer is the uh, government is the computer, it looks like a realm. Isn't that going to come from AFI and so on? Yeah, but the thing is that it's not an actuality. The people are reading that and the people are going to read it. Yeah. This uh, hand up here first, and over here, yes. So the thesis is a fake thesis. And what is your perspective on that? <laughs> You're hoping they don't have that instinct. <laughs> You're hoping that it's not the year 2029 right now, and that there are some of the uh, the cyborgs, the you know the cyborgs have the machines have got a really nice kind of cyborg that comes back that's capable of liquid morphing, doesn't see images, but it's navigatable in all ways, and it's completely invulnerable. <laughs> And then, of course, it meets our representative, which quite, for myself, was pretty pathetic, happens to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. I thought, well, I don't know. When did this vote take place? Yeah, and he was, you know, like human, eh? And what's human? He cracks jokes. He's intuitive. He's improvisational. He's, you know, he's, go he's going back in time himself and tumbling back because he wants to protect the rebellion itself. Well, that's sort of like a humanist fantasy. But is it also, do you think it's a humanist fantasy to say, to immediately presuppose that that artificial intelligence forms won't have an instinct to preserve themselves? Is it possible? Is it possible that in fact, I mean, I think these films are sort of like they're on the edge of something, which is at what point do technologies really come alive? And not alive in a human sense, but in fact in their own sense of species being. Why can't artificial intelligence have a life expression about them and a history and a self-consciousness? I think we're really just on the verge of that. Like the artist Stellar, this Australian Japanese artist who goes around giving performances and stuff, that is his thesis. You know, it's Hans Moravec's thesis. Their thesis is that in fact the machines already have very, you know, immature forms of consciousness. And we're just really at the beginning of, in fact, the life cycle of a machine age. And the machine age is now just beginning to become conscious that, in fact, it's playing with human beings. There's another life form out there. Now, we ourselves are already, we swim in their data network. We rely on them completely for economy and culture and media. They'll see of images itself. And we have a humanist fantasy that that's all dead. It's at least under human control. But what if, in fact, it's a different life form that's beginning to emerge? And these films like Blade Runner and Terminator you know, ask questions of that sort. I don't want to go on because here and then here, I'm sorry. Second, is it also moving this into that risk as, you remember the movie called Short Circuit? No. <laughs> OK. Oh, that's very nice. That sounds like a very. It was like a, like 81. 81. Hmm? Yeah. So, and what happens in this? It's more of a comedy than than anything else, but. Uh, <laughs> Here and then just, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to say that, um, like, I'm not, I'm not as big in the tech as I would like to be or whatever, but I always feel that when it is good, science fiction is just because it's not. Yeah. Like, I don't see that because, like, you know, it's dictating something that the world is supposed to be or whatever. I find that 
agrees with Katie with stressing contemporary issues that are really constant now. Yeah. And I don't know if anybody else, like whenever I, I am watching something science fiction or reading something, I'm always completely like acutely conscious of the fact that I always feel like what I'm reading is happening now. And I don't know if that's a realization as you're saying, like everybody is so saturated in computers and information in general, whether like every day, like I'll look at a table and be like, oh my God, I could never have made that, you know, like how much like industrial power and the kind of machine and technology is involved in everything today, I find is so emerging. And just such like genetic engineering, yeah, as you were saying, the modification of food, like of clothing and just taking over basic human organic functions, I feel is something that to me it seems like science Maybe That's like 50 years ago, you never would have believed this. It's sort of the reality in which we live. It's caught up already. Yeah, but it happens really incrementally, and you don't even sort of notice it. And then suddenly you say, well, it's starting to become kind of say, well, we really are dependent. And then you say, well, what is the status of being human itself? Mm -hmm. Like when you speak about prosthetic memories, which is pretty intimate, really, you can speak about prosthetic memories, or like, like everyone here has artificial memories. What is the difference between your natural memories? in your artificial memories. And if you can't be sure, then you're a cyborg, basically. <laughs> you know, really. If you can't be sure you've got these original memories that are natural, and by God, no one's going to take them away from me, or you've got artificial memories, and remember you have to strip away everything that you've seen, all of image culture, like those five million images that have whopped through your, your eyes and stuff and your imagination itself. And you have to also strip out all songs. You should not hear any songs at all, because you want to have original memories. So you can't have any kind of, no, there's no student I know that could do that. So I view all students as cyborgs, basically. I, just, I, I don't understand Yeah, well, <laughs> the, Alison Landsberg has this article at the end in which she talks about artificial memories. And she begins with, you know, like an old fable in which, you know, the, uh, a, a beggar's land, an artificial arm, the arm begins, in fact, to act independently itself. It begins to be a thief and grabs purses and stuff like this. <laughs> And she says, well, what are these prosthetic memory? What are these prosthetics? And what happens when, in fact, our memory itself becomes a prosthetic memory? When we have memory aids. And memory aids would be what Marshall McLuhan would say, that the media really help us because they expand our sensibility. You know, they expand, for example, our memory. You don't have to really remember anything if you have a computer any longer because you can just store it. You file it and you bring it up when you need it. You also don't have to have a memory of all music that's ever done and even learn to sing the songs, have a, you know, an oral tradition. Because in fact, if you want to listen to music, just go to Kaza and do a bit of file exchanging creatively. Like prosthetic memory, you know, like a, pros a prosthetic that extends the dimension of sound itself. Or your eyes get extended. You know, whose eyes don't get extended by the prosthetic, which would be called television or the cinema or advertising, or billboards, or the whole artificial construction of a city itself. The, you know, the, an element of technology, not its only element, but an important element of technology is that it is so seductive because it is a prosthetic to us. It reinforces us and expands our sensibility itself. By our ability to store information outside of our own body, or outside of anything. Yeah, and, but it doesn't have, but it, then it flips. Right. Well, because it, the memories that you think you're storing outside of yourself then kind of slip inside of you. For example, just, I mean, walk the streets of Montreal. And usually, if you're watching videos, like what's, who's the latest fashion stuff, you can watch how that the, you know, who's popular in music and what songs are popular will slip right out of MTV, go into the stores in terms of clothing, and pretty soon people will be walking along the streets. And Usually, if I'm not following the music scene carefully, I'll say, oh, who's popular today? And then I have to go check it out. And I say, OK, that's the, the tribal costume of the day. But I understand how information flows, uh, electronic information flows become kind of rampant and so on. But I still don't understand the prosthetic memory. I mean, how is, how is it different today, storing more information outside of your own mind by putting in a computer different from forgetting a story and going to see the village wise man or going to a storyteller? Or, you know, I mean, is, 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 the, is the fundamental difference that we now store information outside of the human body or just outside of our own bodies? It seems to me we've been storing it outside of our own bodies for, for, for 
Yep. Yeah, or, well, maybe the question today is which becomes your real body? Like, I think, I know it's, okay. no, I'm sorry. Yes, I know. It's, <laughs> because, that, well, that's at least the question this text is going to be asked. Because it's going to really break down the reality principle and say, well, if you live in a really intense technological society, what is the real body? Is the real body like, is my real body this? Or is my real body the body that comes alive when I listen to music that I like? Or the body that comes alive when I'm reading books that I really like and I go into sort of like dream worlds? You know, you start imagining the yeah, text and things like that. Books have been around long before digital age. And that's why, books, there was some kind of other that's why I was not discriminating against books. No, no, that's, that's not yeah. what I'm saying. I'm just talking about this, this prosthetic, artificial memory, which bodies are. It just seems that technology hasn't added to the situation except for making it a lot more rampant and, and intricate. And okay, no, that's a really good perspective. Did I do think so? I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. thank you very much. <laughs> well, that's what I, I was kind of thinking the same thing as you guys were talking. Yeah. Was, you know, what's the difference between having the task of having written down something and typing it into a computer? It doesn't change it, but it's not, you know, like it's the same thing. It's always been the same thing. Well, that's pretty eloquently stated, too. I knew we were going to get to. Speeding up of a function is not necessarily an element of prosthesis. It's the artificiality of it. Yeah, but what happens? What happens when the technology is not the prosthetic, but you become the prosthetic of the technology? What happens when the field flips? When you, in fact, become the person who's you know the body that's necessary to get the whole, keep the whole thing going, and you yourself wake up and say, "Hey, I'm sort of a prosthetic of the system." <laughs> no, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I just want to recognize everybody. Yes. But aren't you? But aren't you that already? If you want to look at it, and this is back on this you know, comment on what you're saying with life and everything. I mean, I guess it depends on what your definition is. Because I'm pretty much like I don't believe that the technology and computers that that's life. It's not. It's not the same as humans. It's, it's not the same as a human being. It's not the same as an animal. It's not natural. It's not something that would have evolved without us. That would have happened without us. So I don't think that it's life. And like you say, oh. Like, yeah, okay, they're both like computers and everything. Technology needs us to survive, and we need it. But it's only because we've created a dependence on each other. But it's all created by humans. It's not something that would have occurred in nature naturally. So I don't believe that it's a life of its own. Like it is in a different in a different definition of life. It is, but not in the def like maybe to define life. You'd have to define it to say that. But I think that in life, in the sense of like you know the earth and the plants and Minerals yeah. and the whatever, like it's not life, I don't think. On, okay, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's good. So no, none of the unnatural for you. Yeah. You're in the, on the side of the naturals. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, because we're going to be showing hopefully, I, I just have to get it, uh, the, the Darwin film next week. Well, it's just because you know you're saying. Well, have you seen Gattaca? Uh, yeah, I have. Do you like Gattaca? Scrub yourself and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, these are really eloquently put perspective. They're really great. Well, because I think that it's kind of silly to say that it can take us over and it can, you know, well, not silly, but I guess maybe I'm not informed enough, but no, to no. say that it can have a life of its own and whatever, I mean, you. You're being such a modest natural. It, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I, and in my opinion, I think that's true. Like, I mean, it wouldn't exist without, it wouldn't have been existed without us. Without humans making it, it Don't together, starting to No, that's true. And in fact, there's a Richard uh, Dworkin's book, The Smart Gene. This is, in fact, human beings have had this have had an, anthro an evolutionary function that human beings were necessary to carry. In fact, the you know like a new age of technology forward. We carried the gene of technology within us. Now our use is just about finished, and technology itself is about to shed us. Because, in fact, the genes have come outside our nervous system and have been recreated in the, land of t in the world of technology itself, the smart gene. They always find carriers. Now, that's, you know, that's a thesis I don't really necessarily agree with. It's a pretty interesting perspective. And there's a number of people who work in technology have this sense that, in fact, our historical function as human beings is just about finished. 
the cycle is just about over. Right. Hans Moravec from our, our historical function, you know, our historical role. Like Hans Moravec, he's written you know, many great books on robots. He works at Carnegie Mellon as a writer and as a robotic engineer. Says, in fact, you know, in a book called The Mind's Children, says, in fact, that we have given birth to robotic intelligence. It was necess we were necessary to get it going. They are our children, but our children are growing up. They will be smarter than us. They are capable of forms of connectivity we couldn't dream of. They will take evolution to a plane that we, in fact, could never reach ourselves. And he says we shouldn't feel bad about that. We should have a certain pride you know, in the family that's been respond itself. Now, there are a number of people working in technology who I would say are, are if this is a naturalist perspective, are unnatural on the side of the unnaturals, what you might call, one might call the unnaturals. And so it's just interesting perspectives. Who is the prosthetic of whom? I, I don't want to talk too much because the number, uh, I'm just going to go in the order in which I see hands. Yes, here and here and yes. Technology becomes life through you, and you can change the life. You can modify the life. You can modify who you are. And the other type of movie was the kind of, was the kind of movie like Terminator, in which the technology uh, is uh, completely different, and human being can kind of try to well, <laughs> try to live by the human race. But well, that's why my point was. Yeah, no, that's really that's nicely stated. That's good. So. The, um, so you would say that technology actually becomes a life form? In, in that sense, not, 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 a, not, not just technology, but life form by itself, but it becomes a life form through you. Yeah, but do you think that's an anthropomorphic perspective? Yeah. That that's a perspective that surely the sun you know, uh, revolves around us? Is it possible? <coughs> Is it possible that technologically speaking, the history of technology, that we still have that viewpoint? sort of a heliocentric viewpoint, that we still believe that the technology revolves around us. And maybe it's, you know, another perspective would say, well, in fact, it's already begun to flip. We, in fact, begin to revolve around the technology. We are dependent upon it for almost exclusive. Our societies would not function without the technology. We could not have an economy. I mean, Montreal, flip off the switches, cut the energy supplies, this room is black and you know it's dark immediately. We'll have no communication, and we'll have like the were you here during the ice storm? Well, technologies went down. That was a very simple, just of one form of technology, like the power lines coming across. Is everybody happy during the ice storm? Is you're huddling and hoping that someone had a little something to keep us warm and stuff like this? I mean, my sense of the ice storm was, you flip off the switches, the pylons fall down. You have really little ability to communicate with people. I went to get back inside my apartment house, pulled out my card to go through the electronic thing on the door. The scanner didn't go. Went to the bank machine because I really needed some money. No bank machine there. I said, I saw me. It's a cold afternoon. I found myself out in the street and said, well, welcome to electronic homelessness. <laughs> and suddenly what I found was time began, for myself, time began in Mary Louise. We were together began really just to, sh to really arc. Like, you know, a couple of hours seemed like a long, long time. And you really feel sort of worried. Say, well, here you are on an island. What are you really going to do? And stuff like this. You know? <laughs> and fortunately, a friend one had one house with a little bit of light on it. And, and uh, so we watched some stuff. But. <laughs> <laughs>
versus just like natural memory. Yeah. I think that for me when I'm thinking about that, uh, like the idea of a prosthetic memory is something that's added on to you that you, you didn't really have the, the chance to control how, you know, the, uh, your own uh, collection of that memory. So like for me, like mass communication through media is like the number one way that we all have prosthetic memories because any major event that we've witnessed through television or any other media has come to us in this kind of very strictly structured way. Like, especially on TV, I mean, it comes in a little rectangle with sound, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, and you get the same angles of the same event. So everyone has this sort of, we talked about September 11th, everyone has seen the exact same images. Everyone has seen just the angles that existed. We still have the memories of sort of the CNN music, you know? Like, those things are something that we have no control over how we ab absorb them. If we don't witness them live, we have a prosthetic memory of, of pretty much everything that's ever happened in, in our lives, but outside of our own environment. And uh, also, like sort of what you were saying about the sort of life force of technology, I, I don't see it so much as like something that's something that's completely like, well, it's definitely not a, a usual sort of understanding of life, but I, I see it more as like the sort of like a, a a life, a life blueprint, like a dynamic blueprint that we keep adding like ways we can improve onto this massive structure. Like it, and it's it's basically empty and being built. And part of it is that it's everyone who gets involved in it is just getting sucked into it, like adding content, just trying to fill up this massive space that we created for ourselves. It's like too big. Like we don't have enough in ourselves to fill it up anymore. And you, you can they're coming out with this thing called holographic memory storage soon. I've heard read about. And it's something like, uh, it's a three-dimensional kind of way to store data, like a hard drive in a computer. And it can store like one centimeter cube would be able to store every book ever written on, on ever. Like one little centimeter. So I feel like that's kind of like. There yeah. goes history. Yeah. When you get to that point, I mean, they're like, we as intellectual beings could never create the content that we'd love to be able to create to fill up this universe. It's like, we want to fill up this this place we've created, we can't do it. So now we're gonna start needing technology to make the content for us as well, you know? Like if we wanna fulfill this this dream. So I, I think that like as we move forward, we're starting to make technology alive. We, we, we need it to be alive or else we're gonna be bored, basically. Yeah, I think over here and then we're gonna go back. Is that okay? Just in terms of. Well, I wanted to go back to the question of uh, will the computer, uh, are we threatened by computers or not? But I feel like if we're living in this society symbiotic relationship with technology that we have to think of it as a threat a computer could take over I mean just look at the Y2K or even the story I mean we were actually threatened that computers are ruling our lives mm -hmm. not directly like they would take over because that's <coughs> in the movies and artificial intelligence is kind of stretching the reality but in other ways I think the technology is really taking over our like our society and our mindset I just want to say sort of the Y2K too. If anyone's really scared of that, I mean, I was sort of scared of it at one point, but after it sort of ended and nothing happened at all, I started reading about, about a bit more in depth about some authors. And apparently like most of that scare was really in the interest of the big corporations. I mean, if you think about it, people were going out and paying millions of dollars to get new Y2K ready stuff. And everyone went crazy, like, is my microwave gonna work? <laughs> like, there was like pamphlets distributed to my door that said, which of these appliances will work? They're like, don't worry, your fridge should still work, your microwave should, it's like, uh, you know, that was a pretty amazingly orchestrated uh, <laughs> panic. Uh, <laughs> no, no, and I knew I had a, it, there was a problem in the system, because I did a very short, friend did a sh very short parodic film on Y2K, about two years in advance, really, or a year and a half in advance. We did a five minute thing and showed it, and the head of Ontario Hydro saw it, and he asked me if I'd come and speak to Ontario Hydro to about the Y2K <laughs> problem. I thought, the system has a problem. <laughs> when, when in fact, you know, the, the problem is, you know, which is, because it really needs a discussion at a deeper level. It needs a discussion in a, is in a technological culture is like the specter of catastrophe, also part of the necessary logic of a technological society, is, you know, apocalypse now, part of the necessary language of technology of the phase of technology that we're experiencing. Technology hasn't brought upon apocalyptic thinking. Hasn't. It, it hasn't brought it upon. It's, it, it existed before the digital age, and it'll exist after the digital age, and it'll never go away. None of these things, I mean, none of these yeah. things, every civilization has been dependent 
fully dependent on a non-human source. Yeah, no, that was fire or weaponry or whatever it was. I mean, but it's always existed. It's not. Yeah. But you can argue the catalyst through your imagination. Sure, we can talk about 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 catalyzing any form of panic or catastrophe or apocalyptic vision, but in terms of it creating <coughs> artificial memory, or, I mean, this is just it doesn't seem that technology has shifted the paradigm, just intensified it. But that that perspective is is it's a wonderful perspective, but it's simultaneously true, and it's untrue. Because it's true in terms of you know the historical continuity of, for example, apocalypse. Go to Middle Ages, you can talk about the dance of death, talk about the plague, really truly apocalyptic tendencies. But at the same time, every culture has its specificity. And during the Middle Ages, one of the specific, the, you know, the, the sociality was also really working out the really, you know the massive relationships of Christianity to culture, mm -hmm. and the relationships between Christianity and Islamic cultures. In the contemporary age, the dominant referent, the, the frame in which we understand things is not Christianity. The dominant frame of the real language of power is the language of technology itself. Now technology was supposed to strip from us problems like apocalypse, like the language, you know, mythological languages like apocalypse, the dances of death. But who's to say, in fact, that that's happened? Because maybe technology is experienced, and one of its necessary experiences is that it has to provide us with images of its own crash. And maybe what we find most seductive and most delightful about technology is not when technologies work, but when they crash. And so maybe all those scenes of 9-11, which are replayed and re-looped, the scenes of catastrophe, or if you watch like PBS now, PBS for maybe the 80th time is playing in America, over, which is to say whoever gets PBS, playing in you know, like this cold history of the Civil War melancholic, phony history of the Civil War. It, you know, really it tells like one model and tale of the Civil War. You know, it's not as war really about racism. It's about good old Southern boys. Whenever they come on the screen, you get little banjo music being played. You know, and you'd say, well, really is, you know, why is this kind of content? Like, well, is there such a feeling of sometimes apocalypse and sometimes melancholia about technology? Not making any judgment on it, but just trying to understand you know, what Escobar would say is the social grounding of the technology itself. Why is crash so important? Is that accidental to technology? Or is the experience of crash, is like Paul Virilio, the French writer, would say, is really just, you know, the, every technology is born with its crash in mind. And what we enjoy most is not technology that functions, but what we are secretly seduced by is when technology fractures and crashes. The other French thinker, another French thinker like Jean Baudrillard would say, you know, the you begin with a spectacle of you're going fast and you're in the plane or car that's about to crash and you get the cracked windshield. And what we're more interested in the culture is not the car that's streaming along in an advertisement, but the cracked windshield itself when things begin to break down and begin to fissure. And that's not to provide any answers, just to open up a question as to what is the specificity of the techno, you know, what Escobar would call the techno space that we live in. You know, why does it, in fact, really bring back the dance of death and apocalypse? Why, in fact, in a, you know, the height of technology, one of the heights of technology, are we returning really in politics to a very medieval language of the Crusades, you know, with the West against the Islamic cultures? Why is it us and them? Why, if we have complexity theory, which is all about, you know, breaking boundaries and flows and circulating, why do we have political leaders of the world getting up and saying, you're either with us or you're against us. So I would say, well, the, just the specificity of technology is that it spawns real contradictions. It brings back as its content the whole weight of, of in this, you know, in our situation of Western history and of Eastern history as well. So, Nate. Yes, and then we're going over here, I promise. Yes. Uh, It's true. But I think, I think it's more of an alert of flying even than our ideas that constitute that, that very sort of specific view of technology in the future. 
Yeah, it's true. Or if my friend Derek de Kirchhoff was here and speaking about technology, he's written a great book, you know, The Skin of Culture, has a really utopian, post McLuhanite perspective on culture. He would never, we wouldn't be talking about pessimistic perspectives or nihilism at all because he would be incapable of it. Because he's really, you know, he's an artist and really tries to think of, well, what creative possibilities of connectivity, new forms of communication and community are possible with the technology. But he'd also be, he's also writes books like his next book he's writing is McLuhan for Managers. So, you know, those two things, that's part of what Escobar would say is a perspective, of a utopian perspective to this. So it's a really good point. It's excellent. Okay, now, Alex, yes. Going way, way back. back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll put it in the, put it in the hologram. <laughs> about it. I mean, this stems from the fact that we still have these feelings that we have some soul or something, some creative force that other people don't have that resides within us, but science, that's, that idea is being destroyed by the fact that science is more and more saying that we ourselves are brain machine and toy we work, and we are, in fact, just basically a collection of wires with a bunch of chemicals running through us, and all our memories and ideas are really actually supposed to just be, you know, the little firing of neurons or whatever in your brain, which is such a hard concept for us to grasp, because how are, you know, chemicals or electrons firing in my brain allowing me to come up with an idea right now? But apparently this is the case. So in that case, why is it so hard to imagine a machine that we admittedly have originally created, but made similarly to us, except instead of being made out of flesh and blood, it's made out of wire and plastic and metal that is essentially doing the same thing our bodies are doing to us out of different materials? Yes. And what happens when that machine, like us, can s censor it, you know, can sense itself and says, I have a fatal breakdown going on. I need to do a recoding. I need to do a memory upgrade, like my computer in my office does all the time. The machine itself senses, says, you need an upgrade right now. Press this button. Still needs me to do that. There's no reason it should need me to do that. It should just take care of it itself. and probably can. I mean, that seems to be part of it. It seems to be performing all having all the attributes of life itself, has a memory, has connectivity, machine connectivity, certain machine talk to chatter is going on all the time at much faster rates than we talk, and seems to have the will to continue itself, to cure itself, chaos theory. So who are we, so there may be the naturals, but is, are the unnaturals, these machines, I mean, why can't they be a life form themselves? And It's following human evolution, but just uh, on a different path. And it doesn't say that somebody didn't make us. It contradicts too. evolution. Evolution doesn't allow for one species to create the next species. It allows yeah. for it to evolve into the next yeah. species. So, 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 that, not so it defies, evolution. no, but, but it defies it. No, no, <coughs> there's never been a species created by the one that came before it. Right, yet. Yet, there never which, has which, is, which is why we can't but open into evolution. That? I mean, we can't even lump it into another form of creativity if we like to, but it, it doesn't follow. <laughs> <laughs> here, here, and here. Okay. Yes. Um, well, yeah. Uh, skipping ahead a little bit, um, it was something about uh, we were talking about life and like say the same thing, technology. Is it you? Are you it? Whatever. Uh, and I forget what he was saying over there about. Like he, uh, I forget exactly what it was, but something along the lines of like, oh, you know, if your bank card's not working or whatever, like you're not alive in technology or whatever. Something like, okay, whatever. What was it that you were saying again? No. It was something. I don't remember. You need a, you need an upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> If your life is defined only by you, if, you, if, 
to what you're doing by just wanting to talk about it. Uh, the technology itself that you use to do things that you that you do in life. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yep. Because he was saying, oh yeah, you use technology. Okay. But the thing is, is that if say for example, if you don't, if you're not on technology anymore, it doesn't make it that you don't exist. Do you, you know what I mean? It's hard to make the connection, but. I had it before. And then the ice storm, so I'll just go to the next thing. So the ice storm thing, I think, in a way, I was pretty miserable during that too. But in a way, I think that it was, looking back, that it was great. I mean, if you think about it, it's, you know, like life didn't end without all the technology. We were still existing. You might not be able to function your normal way, but I mean, you yeah. made it that your garage door can't open without the button. You know, like it's not like life ends without that. And in a way, I think it's, That's true. it was great to put us. You know, like, yeah, take away all the technology, take away all the electricity, and it puts you back in your place. You know, we think that we're so smart and so evolved or whatever, but when, you know, with Mother Nature, it sounds kind of spiritual or whatever, but, like, it's true. Like, against Mother Nature and against, like, real, like, Earth and whatever, you're not, you know, like, it puts us back in our, our place that we think that we have such a hand in everything and that we have control over everything or whatever. We no, that's totally good. Don't. That's and good. I think that it's, like, a really good thing every once in a while that maybe people don't, like, you know, uh, think about the appreciation side of it, that you have to be reminded of that every once in a while, I think, you know? Yeah. Okay, now, I'm trying to get the order here. Here, 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 and you had your hand up before. Yeah, but that's okay. I'm sorry, I apologize. I apologize. Um, I guess I have two points to make. One is that, well, on the side, I'm not a big fan of sci-fi, and I probably just really paranoid, but I think if we created a But just I, I think it, it just makes me so crazy with all this uh, um, scientific trying to create life. You can understand why we humans have such an obsession to play God and to create these things that are, you know, to create human life. You know, who it makes me think, who, who do you think you are? And to, to create these little machines that we become so dependent on. And then I guess my other point is that um, just sitting in this room with all this technology, know, with all of these um, screens and speakers, and I took the first time internet classes this summer, which um, at first I thought was a great idea, you can do it on your own time, and then I realized this is not what I'm paying for, I'm paying for the human interaction, for someone to actually sit there and teach me, not to be able to be secluded in my um, apartment living in a nice free democratic country with the internet, to be able to sit there writing what we think, you know, judging these that don't have access to all this. Huh. And who decided in this university that this is the right way to spend the money? That, that technology is the most important thing because I find that Concordia is placing all of their emphasis or so much of their emphasis on what is you know the new big thing and, and move it all, putting all the money towards technology and saying that this, it's placing importance on this over so many other things. Yeah. Which no, that's good. That, but that's like Escobar's perspective in some ways, right? Or Escobar, because you're asking exactly the questions he would ask, which is to say that, that the question of technology has a social grounding, and it's embedded in questions like, why does this university put so much emphasis now on technology? Why are the major resources in the university being committed to informatics? Like the colossal building being built on, on, um, on St. Catherine, informatics and visual arts, and visual arts, and engineering. I mean, that's, like, that's, a, that's an incredible in public policy decision on the part of the university. When you look over at these social sciences and humanities, you see cramped classrooms, you know, not great, the greatest facilities for learning and teaching, and oftentimes not great access to technologies themselves. The university has made a decision that it's going to tilt one direction. It's, tip the it's beginning to tip the university in that direction. Mm 